It's an unusual opportunity to be speaking to the Vice President of the Artificial Intelligence at Samsung SDS America. It's really unusual. We will try to explore the field and get more insight into what's happening. Uh, Patrick, could you please introduce yourself and what do you do for business? Yeah, hi, Noor. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here on, on your podcast. Uh, my name is Patrick Bungert. Um, I work as the Vice President for Artificial Intelligence at Samsung SDS, which is the IT company in the Samsung family of companies that is probably best known for its mobile phones. Um, so we run the data centers, we write the software, um, and we do the artificial intelligence modeling um, within the, the brand. So um, underneath the AI department, there are two sections. One is the AI engineering, which writes the software, and the other is the AI sciences that does the data science and the, the consulting effort. Um, and I get to lead that. Um, so uh, that's, a, that's a very exciting task. Uh, by training, I'm a mathematician. So I've been in artificial intelligence my entire career, um, seen the development from uh, the previous AI winter um, over this new revolution of deep learning to the current point where artificial intelligence is a household word. So I'm very glad to uh, be engaged in podcasts like this one where uh, we discuss what it is all about because I think that there are some misunderstandings, some on the hype side um, where uh, people think that AI can do more than it can, um, as well as some on the fear side where people are afraid of certain things that they really don't need to be. So let's start exactly. What is artificial intelligence? What does it do? That is an excellent question. Um, artificial intelligence really is a mathematical representation of some kind of process. So if you think back to your high school physics, um, this guy called Isaac Newton came up with the universal law of gravitation uh, some 400-ish years ago. And it's a formula that says, you know, the force between two planets is governed by an equation. There's the equation. I'm not going to bore you with that. That's a mathematical representation of a physical effect. It's simple enough for us to write it down on a piece of paper to understand what that represents. But let's say the physical effect that you want to model is a bit more complex than that. Then it will require a formula that you can maybe no longer write down on a piece of paper that you can no longer fully understand, and that's what artificial intelligence is there to produce. Um, not only will it actually create that representation, but it will make that representation executable in real instances. Uh, facial recognition is a perfect example, right? I take in a photograph of a human face, and now I'm supposed to identify who it is. Mm -hmm. um, so that representation is too complex for us to write down an equation. And we want this to be able to execute in fractions of a second so that when I approach a door, the door will open or stay closed, depending on whose face it is. So that's why we need artificial intelligence to be able to make that representation happen. What, what do you do with artificial intelligence uh, in, in Samsung? So we actually train uh, AI models for a wide variety of possible use cases. So um, if you are an owner of a Samsung mobile phone, and uh, there will, for example, be a service called Bixby on it. Uh, Bixby is our natural language processor. So if you want to give commands to your mobile phone to, to do certain things, like call your friend Joe or something, then it's Bixby that, that does that. Underneath that is a natural language model um, that understands what you say, uh, can then do what it is that you say, and also give its response back to you in, in language. Uh, there's a fingerprint scanner, um, which identifies you by uh, the, the pattern of your fingerprint on your thumb. There's a facial recognition uh, built in there, which recognizes you based on your face. Um, there's a search engine that will find uh, what you're looking for. Um, there's a recommender engines like you're used to in Netflix where you know, you've watched a few movies and now it suggests another movie for you to watch. That's, that's a recommender engine. So uh, you see that there are um, things from a natural language processing, from image processing, from time series processing. So all of these things are 
uh, being dealt with for a variety uh, of use cases. So uh, you can even go um, away from the usual Samsung devices and uh, we do medical applications, for example, where we recognize uh, whether or not you have cancer based on an MRI scan. Um, a whole bunch of use cases can be pursued. So you are doing all of these uh, things on the mobile phone. How much space do you take or do you need inside the phone for these tasks? So actually we do many use cases that are outside of the phone. Um, there are of course some that, I, that I've mentioned that live inside the phone, um, but for example, medical applications and, and such, they're not executed on your, on your phone. Um, and it doesn't require very much space on the phone. So if, uh, if you look at you know, the standard Samsung phone, uh, it has the Android operating system on it. Um, and on top of that live these um, additional apps so we're, we're just talking, you know, a, a couple of tens of megabytes for these apps. So the models are not big because you're not creating them on the phone. You're just executing them on the phone. So the models are small. How much data do you have to uh, put on the program or the application to be able to function? Uh, well, yourself as a user, uh, virtually nothing. Um, but to create something like that, you have to have a great deal. So imagine that you have a natural language processing system. You have to train it usually with terabytes um, of input text or input speech uh, in order to make the model. But once the model is made, you need hardly any data to run it. Oh yeah, okay. So what is the framework of a data science project? Very good question again. So um, I would say at the very beginning, you have a conversation between the data scientist who understands the mathematical aspect and the domain expert who knows whatever the problem is. And these two people have to understand each other very well. Uh, so there are many cases um, in, in several companies that I've worked where if that conversation doesn't happen very well, the project's a failure that point onwards. So that's the crucial part in the beginning. Then you get your data, as much of it as you can get a hold of um, from all different data sources that you can possibly access, just sponge up everything. Then you have to clean it. Um, so you typically find that there is a substantial portion of your data which doesn't represent the situation you're dealing with. Um, maybe some data is unreliable. Um, has a high uncertainty. Uh, all that needs to be removed. Um, any missing values need to be filled in. Uh, so you have quite a bit of data cleansing and data curation to do. That's the point where typically I'd say 80% of the work lies, cleaning up your data. That's the real work in data science. <clears throat> then you go on and decide, what kind of AI am I going to train? On, on this data set, you know, is it going to be a neural network, a decision tree, a time series analysis, whatever? Um, then you go away and do that. Um, and there are tools um, that, that we generate here. The, the BrightX AI Accelerator is our main engine to drive that creation uh, of these, uh, these AI models. And then once you're done, there is again a communicative uh, strategy where you have to go back to your user and say, okay, we solved your problem, we think and here's how it works and is this the output that, that you wanted and now there is an element of change management where you have to convince your end users um, of which usually there are many to actually adopt this new thing this uh, fangled tool to do something different and that's the second aspect where most projects fail uh, is convincing the users to actually make use of this tool. Yeah, so those is, that's roughly the, the, the workflow. So it's only that the you know, second to last piece where you actually train the model that's mathematically heavy and the rest is, is kind of preparation and, and cleanup. Let's go to the cleanup process. How, how do you do that? Well, it's, it's really a management uh, process, right? It's, it's again, conversations with the users that you need to have. 
hopefully you've had some of this at the very beginning where you explore how exactly do you want the, the result of the AI evaluation to be delivered. Um, you know, do you need some special interfaces? Do you need some special graphics? Uh, will a number do? Um, you know, in what kind of IT interfaces do you need the number delivered? Um, that's very important because again, if you change your mind during the project, that leads to a lot of extra effort at the end. Uh, and of course, if the final end user, they, they really want uh, like an image, but they get a number, then they're unhappy. Um, and then they won't use your tool. And so the entire work you did is useless because nobody uses it. So uh, how you deliver your answer to the problem is, is really quite crucial. And you can only explore that in conversation. Because people change their minds, of course, it's best to show them a mock-up um, ahead of time. And so, okay, if it, if it looks like this, will, will you like it? Yeah? If, you, if it looks like this, will you like it more? Um, and that conversation might take a while. Yeah? This, this is not like it's done in a few hours. It might take several weeks for people to, to think this through and ask their friends and uh, so on, you know, what's the, the kind of democratic vote? What does everybody like best? So that, that's an exploration. Let's get to the second part where you convince um, the, the users. Are there certain techniques or tools to deal with this situation? Well, um, I don't think that there are um, many technical tools uh, for it. Yeah. Um, there are kind of managerial tools, if, if you like, right? There's workshops and, uh, you know, the, the usual kind of workshopping techniques uh, that, that you would use where everybody comes up with ideas and kind of writes them on a post-it and then you have a post-it wall and then you, you do kind of a several series of democratic voting and sorting of those into a priority order and things like that. So the, the usual kind of management uh, quote unquote tools, but these are not software tools. These are, these are people tools um, to guide that conversation. Let's go to the domain knowledge. How does it make um, projects faster, cheaper, and more likely uh, to, yield, to yield a useful answer? So in my personal opinion, domain knowledge is the most valuable aspect um, of a data science project. Um, I've, I've written a couple of articles on, on LinkedIn just discussing this. So basically, if your proposition is, we have an expert, let's teach him a, a little bit of AI by taking a, a week's course worth on, on Coursera or YouTube or the internet, and then let's you know, go, go away and do it, that will fail. The opposite, where you say, okay, we have a data scientist who's really good at math. Here, give him his data set and let him figure it out. That will fail also. And both have been tried many times uh, in, in various companies, various use cases, they, they fail. You need at least two people. Uh, one person who is a domain expert and one person who is a data scientist, a mathematical expert. You cannot have both in one person. And the reason for that is very simple. It takes time to learn these skills. Before you're a domain expert, you need to spend several years full time in that domain. To become a fully qualified data scientist, you have to spend several years at university learning this and then in practice, um, you know, figuring out how to actually do that. You, you can't do both. There's just not enough time in your career to, to do both. So you need at least two individual people. Um, actually in practice, you usually need more than two. You need several domain experts and several data scientists to actually carry out the project. And that's why this conversation is so crucial. There, there are real people that need to sit in a room or at least on a Zoom call like we are and discuss this at length. How does the work between the two of these people happen? Right, I think, um, first of all, they, they kind of need to understand each other's point of view. Um, so, from the data scientist and from the domain expert, they're used to talking in a certain language. And both of them might speak English, 
but they will use very different vocabulary. Uh, they will use acronyms um, that mean different things to different people. Um, and so they will have to each learn each other's vocabulary, at least to some extent. Um, so the data scientists will have to learn whatever the special words are in that domain. And the domain expert will have to learn some data science vocabulary. Uh, and they need to be aware that they need to do this um, because otherwise you'll talk about acronyms and the one person will understand something very different from the other. So just that awareness takes a little while. And then they need to make each other aware of some of the important things. So a, a domain expert will, for example, take certain facts as obvious uh, to the data scientist who doesn't know anything about the domain. Those are not obvious at all. He doesn't even know them. Yeah. 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 So, um, you know, if, if we're, if we're talking medical applications for, for example, right. If, if the, uh, if the hospital says, okay, we did uh, a CT scan here and an MRI scan there and an X-ray scan there to me, they're all photographed, right? I don't, I don't know what the difference is. So <laughs> you're going to have to explain this to me, right? How, how, are, how, are, how are these different? And to, to a doctor, that's completely obvious. So um, here are some of those things where you, you have to baseline this and it, pick each other up from where you are to educate. You know? So if I, if I talk to them back, back to the doctor and say, okay, the, the standard deviation in the probability of distribution is so, so and so much, you know, is, that, is that okay for you? And he's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> right? So then I need to do the same thing for, for, the, for, for him, right? I need to tell him, okay, a probability distribution looks like this. And that's what I mean when I say it. And it, there's a diagram. And so th there's a little bit of um, education going both ways before you can really dive in. Can we, uh, like, can you, the new generations start both domain knowledge and data uh, expertise at the same time? Well, that's my main message. No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so yeah, if, if, if I can give one advice to uh, younger people entering any sphere, any sphere is specialize. Uh, if you attempt to do many things at the same time, then uh, you will be what, what we in English call a jack of all trades. You'll have a little bit of knowledge of many fields and um, that, that will not serve you very well in your career. It's, it's best to be a specialist in one thing uh, with an open mind, of course, that you can talk to people from other disciplines, but be a specialist in one area. Okay. What are the levels of domain knowledge? Well, um, I'd say, you know, in, in my article on LinkedIn, I, I point out a, a few different uh, sort of level. So the, the, the first level, of course, you, you, you enter into, into the domain not, not really knowing anything about it, you, you know, as much as everybody else does. Um, and then you might get an education, uh, either a university level education or a company training. And then you have an intellectual knowledge of what's going on. Uh, then in your first year or two, um, you will be uh, apprenticed, let's say that may be a formal apprenticeship, like it's common in Europe, um, or it might be a, a sort of, uh, again, it, it, internal company training type of program where you go out and you get your hands dirty and you, you actually do what, what you're supposed to do. Um, then you get some uh, initial feeling of, of what it means to, to actually do it. Uh, then you might spend another two, three, four years after that uh, doing the work independently, at which point you become more and more used to it. And at that point in your career, where you are the trainer for the future company trainees, that's when you're a domain expert. Uh -huh. Right? So um, there's a, a, there are a few famous statements. I think it was Richard Feynman, the, the physics Nobel laureate, who, who became famous for saying this, right? If you if you cannot explain your subject to your grandmother in five minutes, then you don't understand it. 
right? So this is the thought process, right? So can I explain what I do to somebody who doesn't know anything about this in a couple of minutes? And if, if I can do that and that person gets it, then I understand what I'm doing. But if I need half an hour or fancy vocabulary, then I myself don't even know, right? So that's the real test of are you a domain expert or not? Yeah, great. And what are the levels of data science? Well, similar thing. Um, so at first you get a formal education and you might get a bachelor's degree or a master's degree in it, or, or you might take online courses and get certificates. <clears throat> then uh, you, you will do um, a data science project or two or three and gather some experience on what it's actually like. Um, for data science, that's particularly um, onerous, I guess, because it involves writing computer code, typically. Um, and so that skill of learning how to uh, write computer programs in, in programming languages, that, that's something that really takes time. Um, right. So, I mean, he, here again, one of those statements, right. Um, in, in terms of writers, right. There's, there's, there's my nephew and then there's Shakespeare, right. And somewhere in between those two people, um, there, there's a level of goodness. Yeah. Um, where any, anything ab above that is, is, is good and anything below that, not so good. So, um, in that scheme of things, uh, programming is, is similar, right? So just because you took a, a course in, in Python doesn't make you Shakespeare in Python, right? But um, if you really want to be a very good data scientist, you, you might have to at least aim to get there. And so again, it takes experience, it takes time, um, it takes a few failures. Um, before you've, you've learned. And once again, if you're at the point where you can teach data science to other people, that's when you're uh, an expert in data science. What is the minimum age of a data scientist? Ha! <laughs> I don't think that there is one. Um, so, I mean, I, I've met um, people who during their high school education and knew enough programming, enough mathematics, enough statistics to be able to do a data science project, no problem at all. And you will meet people like this on Kaggle and similar you know, competition platforms on the internet where they're 17 years old, 18 years old, and they do fine. Uh, of course, there aren't a huge number of them, but there are some. So um, I don't think that there's a real minimum age, but those people will be able to do the programming and the mathematics just fine, but they will have trouble with the communication aspects. Um, and that, as I said, is the main cause of failure in real life. So that kind of data scientist will have to be assisted by someone who can communicate well. But yeah, maybe the minimum age is 16, 17. Oh yeah, that's a great, <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> What is the difference between studies done by a company alone and done in cooperation with an operator? Right. Um, I mean, again, it comes back to the domain expert uh, question. Um, if the company that does the uh, data science has the domain expertise in-house, then you're just fine. And if you don't, then you need the, the operator, if you will. Yeah, so it, it depends on the on the use case again. Um, I mean, for example, I know AI companies that have uh, medical applications in mind and they've actually hired full-time doctors and surgeons and so on to be on the staff, then they can do everything in-house. Um, if you don't have a collection of doctors in-house, in but you wanna do medical applications, you better cooperate with a hospital um, because otherwise you will do something that's irrelevant. Um, oh, yeah. What, what has driven accuracy up to 99.9%? Yes, uh, this, is a, this is a feature you find all over the machine learning literature. Um, people compete with each other uh, on particular data sets or particular type of problems with accuracy. And um, every once in a while, uh, you know, maybe on a, on a 
fortnightly basis or so, you see new publications saying that, oh, regarding this uh, standard problem, we've achieved uh, an, an accuracy improvement of, you know, 0.02% or something. And so, so yes, it's a new world record. Um, you know, it's, it's an improvement. It's better than everybody else. But the margin that you've improved it by is very, very slight. Um, and the question is, is that really relevant? Um, so in certain cases, um, in certain rare and special cases, I should say, the accuracy is so important that that may actually matter. And medicine is, again, an, an example of that. Right? If, you, if you detect cancer slightly more accurately than the previous person, then you'll end up saving lives. So that's a good thing. But in, in most applications, it doesn't really matter. Right, so in, for example, in natural language processing, if uh, the previous, uh, you know, speech to text uh, processor is accurate to 99.9% and mine is 99.92%, there is no real difference. Um, and the amount of effort that I might have to make to port my entire IT system from the previous model to the new model may be so costly in terms of, of time and effort and expenses that this extra um, accuracy gain is, is just economically really not relevant at all. So I see the main driver for these competitions to be, well, on the one hand is ego, and on the other hand is publisher parish. Um, if you are a, a member of the academia, a PhD student, you know, postdoc student, um, you know, tenure track professor, um, then you have to justify your existence and your promotion opportunities until you become tenured by publishing a lot. And in that regard, you know, every little sliver of improvement that you can get will get you a publication. So of course you're going to do that. Um, so we find, you know, in, in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, people used to publish maybe 20 to 30 papers um, over their entire career as university professors, uh, publishing there for one, one paper every year and a half or so. Nowadays, um, you know, the self-respecting uh, computer science professor will publish between five and 10 articles every single year. Uh -huh. uh, now, you have to think that the, the quality of those publications, of course, has sunk quite a lot. Otherwise, he cannot produce that quantity. So that's really where I see the driver of these incremental improvements being. Yeah. Why do you consider life and user as sources of uncertainty? Everything is uncertain. Right. So um, imagine, for example, you're driving in your car and the odometer shows you, you know, how fast you're driving. Right. Now, the, now the police on the corner will have their little radar gun and they will say, ah, you were over the speed limit by a certain, certain amount, right? They will always subtract from what they measured a certain number of miles an hour, yeah? maybe th three or five miles an hour they will subtract. Why do they do that? Um, their radar measurement device is quite accurate, right? It's not perfect, but it might be accurate to 0.1 miles an hour. So you can almost ignore that. But your odometer is not very accurate at all. Yeah. So what you see in your car is, is a little needle moving, right? And the difference between this much and this much is 50 miles an hour, 60 miles an hour, 70 miles an hour. So you can't really tell more than about five-ish miles an hour how fast you're going. Um, and that's the accuracy. That's why they subtract that, that amount. So there's an, a practical example that has influence on you know, all of our daily lives where there is a measurement that we look at all the time, which is uncertain, and it has a consequence in the legal system. Um, but everything you measure, temperatures, pressures, flow rates uh, in, in the operating scheme, uh, pictures that you take with a medical device, facial recognition pictures that you, you take, they're all a little bit uncertain, a little bit blurry, um, a little bit, you know, overexposed on one end of the image and underexposed on the other end of the image, whatever, 
all of these uncertainties you have to deal with. And one of the most important parts of data science is sorting out all of those uncertainties and making sure that your model knows that it has a certain uncertainty and exposes that. Oh, so what are algorithms? The algorithms are those methods that actually make the AI model. So we said at the beginning of the conversation, an AI model is a mathematical representation of something. The algorithm is the thing that makes that representation. So essentially an algorithm is like a cooking recipe, right? So if I tell you, you know, to make great pancakes, you need, you know, one cup of flour, one cup of milk, one cup of sugar, and you mix it up, you put an egg in there and so on. And that's a recipe. An algorithm is the exact same thing for mathematics. Let me ask you a question here. Like, what do you think? How much intelligent is artificial intelligence? Um, not very much. So the, uh, the, the reason for that is that, um, what is intelligence, right? We, we could have a philosophical debate about this for, for a very long time. But um, if we just very briefly say, intelligence is that which human beings uh, kind of express, right? We can do a great many things um, using our, uh, for lack of a better word, brain. And, you know, we can communicate, uh, that's natural language processing. We can recognize objects with our eyes. Um, you know, there's, uh, um, image processing. Um, we can do it with smell and taste as well, which is something very new in AI. But by the way, people are developing sensors for smell and taste nowadays. Um, we can sense things by touching them, right? So I can sense the, the texture uh, of things if I, if I touch. Okay. So I can also touch things, uh, right? And, and I see what the, what the texture is with, with my fingers. Uh, and as far as robotics is concerned, that is still very much state of the art and, and new being explored. So the one human being can do all of these things and we can do it simultaneously, right? When, when you're eating a meal, you're, you're, you're looking at it, you're chewing it, that's robotics, you're tasting it and smelling it and it, swallowing it and all of these things simultaneously. And you can even carry on a conversation. Now that's beyond uh, any kind of AI system that we have accessible today. In fact, any AI system that we do have today specializes in one very, very narrow task. And if you have a computer or a robot that can do multiple of these things, it is multiple AI models that are working completely independently on the same device to make that happen. It is not one AI model that can do multiple things simultaneously. So we are far away from that kind of integration. Um, the uh, inventor of computer science, Alan Turing, um, he came up with something he called the Turing test or later people called it the Turing test. Um, where the idea is that a human being has a conversation with, let's say, an entity. And he cannot see the entity at all. They can just have an exchange of, uh, of words. And at the end of that conversation, you're supposed to be able to tell, am I talking to another person or am I talking to a computer? Now, that level of, of test, I think we're getting, we're getting closer for a computer to be able to pass that test. We're not quite there yet. Um, so there was a model called GPT-3 that was released, uh, I think only a month ago now. Um, when you talk to it, the responses mostly uh, sound quite good. Um, you can get it it, with logical questions. If you ask it to do arithmetic, for example, it will fail. Um, or if, if you ask it, you know, basic logical things about family relationships and things like this, it will fail. 
because it can very well converse with you, but it doesn't know anything about the world. It doesn't know facts and, and relationships very well. So even that Turing test is currently still beyond reach. But I think actual intelligence of people goes far beyond just having a conversation with somebody. All these other things I mentioned play a role as well. So I think before we have that, a lot of time will elapse. And then if you let me, one, one more thing is that human beings, of course, have certain skills like creativity, um, like free will, um, making decisions that are, are based on, on certain desires that change over time. I think that is very, very far away for computers to be able to emulate that. Of course, we can prescribe a goal, right, um, for an AI, but that's not the same thing as having free will to make your own goals. Yeah, awesome. Uh, okay, where do you think people have misunderstood artificial intelligence? Hollywood. Um, so movies like, uh, you know, 2001 Space Odyssey or Terminator, um, have influenced the public perception of AI quite a lot. So one end of the spectrum is that many people believe that the AI systems displayed in those movies are actually realistic. Um, they're not. Uh, again, we're very far away from being able to have a system like HAL from 2001 Space Odyssey or, or the Terminator. Um, those are not realistic uh, portrayals of the capability at all. Um, and secondly, people are afraid that AI will somehow um, take over the world. Now, on that note, AI has taken over the world. That's already happened, so no need to be afraid of it. You know, if you think of Google that you use every day or Netflix that you watch uh, at night or, uh, you know, Amazon where you do your shopping, all that's AI-powered systems, so you do interact with AI on a daily basis. But those AIs are not dictatorial. They're not taking over your life, right? They're not the Terminator. Um, so I don't think that there is a need to be afraid that AI will be a, a kind of ruling class and humanity will be enslaved by AI. I don't, I don't think that that's realistic in any kind of realistic time frame. Yeah. What else would you like to say? Uh, well, I think AI is a field that's really, really popular these days. Um, it's being hyped up quite a lot. So um, I would say to all of you who are interested in AI, um, be a little bit careful about what you hear. Throw some salt uh, over what you read. Um, many claims are a little bit overemphasized. They're not realistic. On the other hand, it's a field that is growing and developing at a fantastic speed. So we're making new innovations on a, uh, on a monthly basis. Um, definitely over the foreseeable future, but I think decades into the future, this field will grow in all of its aspects. So if you feel motivated to enter this field, it's definitely worthwhile as a career path. Um, there are uh, courses online that you can take. Uh, many of them are free of charge. Uh, you know, you can have a look at that, um, but to get properly educated, it is worthwhile to dive deeper and uh, take a few serious math classes. I know they're not popular, but that, that would be a really good foundation. Um, then, of course, computer programming is involved here as well. So it will take some time to be involved, but it's, uh, it's a good choice uh, for a career path, given how the field is exploring. And um, if you just want to use it, um, there are many, many tools available that you can just deploy and companies that will also rent out the staff uh, to do it together with you. So if you're excited at exploring something like this, please feel free to get in touch with me. Um, you can find my own profile, Patrick Mungard on LinkedIn. Uh, there is a YouTube page uh, that we have where you can see a bunch of educational videos. Look for the SAS, uh, SDS AI team on YouTube and uh, you will find some good content. 
It has been more than great, more than good talking to you, Patrick, today. Uh, I really appreciate your time, your help, and your great, uh, great uh, knowledge about this field. Thank you very much, Noor, for having me on your show. Thank you.